you went to a therapist. Why was that? I was having difficulty uh, adjusting to success, really. And um, I was uh, unhappy. And he said, look, you're, you're in a golden birdcage. Five days a week you have to go and work, and then you go home and you're happy and blah, blah, blah. You're making a lot of money. You should be so lucky. He said, um, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about all this stuff. He had seen a lot of my friends, and he knew the things that uh, successful actors were going through and so forth. So he said, uh, and at that period of time, LSD was legal. And he says, why don't you try it? And so I investigated different ways of doing it, and I, I did. I tried it, and it was... It changed my life. It changed my life into uh, about life and death and success and non-success. And it was a wonderful experience. That's what happened? It. I took it and all of a sudden an opening appeared in the room like, like a tunnel. And I went through this tunnel and, and shoo, with a, a, an intensity. And I went down to this kind of white light that was the end of this tunnel. And there was something at the end saying, okay, you've achieved this, remember it, and experience it and enjoy it, but it's not time for you to go through to the ultimate end, the end of life. It was uh, an experience like um, being one with everything, with the cosmos, with everything. And I still experienced that. And it, it, it was an illuminating experience that gave me a compassion and and ended the fear of death for me. And it was, it was really great. And did it solve your problem? Yes, it did. Yes. How? I stopped smoking. I stopped worrying. I stopped uh, caring so much for success. Because it would come if you put yourself in the right mode, the right frame of mind. And then this is um, my house up in the country oh it looks is this the house called heaven heaven that's heaven yeah that's as close as i'm ever going to get and here's a nice picture of it here too this is one house yeah it's, it's called my village <laughs> <laughs> it's really like a small village it is it and is. why is it called my village my because she built it she designed it and uh did the architecture yeah. and uh and did the contract it took four years to make that thing yeah Hekman heeft in zijn appartement een macabre huisgenoot ingelijfd. And how old is this? It's about 3000 yeah. years old. Just about 3000 years. But don't you mind having something so involved with death in your house? Death? You down to, you know, basics. Huh? That guy's still with us, see? The representation of him. Death <laughs> is part of life. Everybody's got to do it. Everybody avoids it in the in the Western culture, the Eastern cultures. It's more a part of everyday life, you know. Yeah, is it part of your life? It's going to be <laughs> yours too. So then I thought. Hackman is nooit bang voor de dood geweest. Hij heeft het er dan ook jarenlang van genomen: cigarettes and whiskey. Kissing a girl who smokes, even a girl as beautiful as you are, honey, is like kissing an old ashtray. Don't be polite about your health. I stopped smoking in 66 because I had read what it does to you. Up until then, all the tobacco companies had said, oh, it's wonderful. You, the doctors say smoking won't hurt you. They lied. So I, I believe it. But then the Surgeon General of the United States government came out and said it's, it could kill you. And so I stopped smoking. Nobody had really come out about alcohol. Everybody said it was bad, but they didn't come out with specifics like they did about smoking. And by that time, they did. It was too late for me. I, I destroyed my liver. Yeah. How did you find out that you were ill? Uh, I, I was going, I was working out, going to a gym, and my uh, gymnasium teacher, you know, my workout, said, uh, you don't seem to have the energy that you've had in the past. And uh, do you have a doctor? And I said, no, I don't. I don't need a doctor. She said, well, go to the guy and have some blood tests done. And I did. And that's how I found out that I had a cirrhosis of the liver. How did you feel when you got that message? I felt like, well, it's about time. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I knew I'd been abusing my body. And I thought I would 
quit before it was, you know, death, you know, before I die. But anyhow, I figured, well, okay, I've gone long enough and I'm paying the price for my behavior. Larry Heckman's lever bleek niet meer te functioneren. Alleen een transplantatie kon hem nog redden. Het was kantje boord. How long did you have to wait before you knew I waited about a year and a half. And then when I finally, they said, you know, we can't go any further with the treatments that we're giving you and so forth. I waited about 36 days, which was phenomenal because the general wait is a couple of years. How come you got it so quickly? I was very, very ill. And they, they measure you by points. And I'd gone up to the top of the list because I was going to die within... Uh, well, when they opened me up, they gave me a couple of months before my uh, before my operation. And when they opened me up, there was like uh, 10 days, two weeks or something like that, I would die. But I had one goal, was to stay in top, as best I could, physical condition. And it paid off for me. So on the one hand, you say, I'm not afraid to die. I was not afraid to mm -hmm. die. So I was rather relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, you did everything you could to stay alive well because I wanted to be when I was gonna die I wanted to be in good physical condition and good mental condition I you know it, I just did I, I didn't give up a lot of people give up and just say okay I'm gonna die and they fear the death and then they still say I want to die because they're conditioned towards that you know but I didn't I just fought it as best I could there you go look here Yes, sir. I'm going to give this to you, $10,000. Wow. In Hackman we trust. Yeah. <laughs> and on the bottom, read that. Okay. Yeah. To receive an organ donor card, please call. This is printed on recycled paper. Why not recycle yourself? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Give your donor. Don't take your, your organs to heaven. Leave them here. We can use them. Yeah. Recycle yourself. Uh -huh. Can you understand that some people don't dare to... Why? To give their organs away. Why, they think the uh, devil is going to get them or something? They were afraid they're not really dead when they're... Oh, yeah, well, I understand lives. that. Well, maybe they're not. I mean, I think that just people don't trust people. So you have to trust people a certain amount of, in life. And uh, if they uh, don't want to give... I always ask people who don't want to give their organs, I said, would you accept one if you needed one? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, of course. And I say, well... Well, how does it work? Mm -hmm. If you'll accept one, but you won't give one. Yeah. Hmm. I have a Puerto Rican donor. I have a Hispanic donor. You know your donor. I did know my donor, yeah. I, I didn't know him when he was alive. No. But uh, uh, we have a, a rag here called the National Enquirer, which is a yellow uh, press. And uh, they had, um, they were following my helicopter that brought me from my ranch down to the hospital and um, they were listening to the frequency, radio frequency so they got another helicopter and followed the helicopter that brought me in when it went to get my liver and then they found out who the mother was and interviewed the mother and so forth and that's and then they printed it which I'm not supposed to do but no. um, and that's how I found out who my donor was and what does that mean to you it means I know who my donor is yeah Mm -hmm. but, but is that something special to know that? Do you it really is. like knowing it? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, they printed a picture of him. And when I'm shaving in the morning, I have a, my, his picture right there. So I see him every day and give thanks to him. That was the man who saved your life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just like he pulled me from a burning building. 